let me welcome you all. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. Today we have one of our special live session events that combines the virtual and the in-person, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. The, uh, the physical event is really exciting, and there's a lot of good conversation happening. I'm really glad to cross the streams and blend all these ideas together. Is again, this is one of those live sessions where we are meeting with a whole in-person group. And this is a group uh, that is in Arizona State University. Uh, and just in case you, th you think this sounds a little bit familiar, um, that's because we have hosted one of their first introductions. I'll put this in the chat box. So this is the 100 Years of EdTech Project, which tries to take a look at educational technology by looking backwards 50 years and forwards 50 years to try to see what we can learn from the past and how we can prepare educational technology for the future. Now, today, at Phoenix, Arizona, at Arizona State University's campus, they're hosting a design summit, which is all about trying to think of new ways that education can respond to these future developments. Now, that means that they have all kinds of things going on. They've had panel sessions, multiple panel sessions. They've had a lot of conversations. And right now, there are a whole bunch of small groups that are broken up, looking into different ways that education can connect it with the future. Everything from genetic engineering to neural links to climate change to uh, medical education, all kinds of great stuff. Now, what I'd like to do for the next hour is I'd like to bring up on stage all kinds of people who are there right now, uh, who are in uh, Arizona State University's fine campus, who would like to share some thoughts and conversation about what are learning and what they've seen. So if you are there right now, I, I feel a bit like a, at, a, at a Ouija board. Um, you know, if you're there, please knock twice. No, uh, if, you, if you're there right now, I'd like to bring you on stage just so you could, just for a few minutes, so you could talk about what you're learning, what you're thinking, what you're making. And so you could, we can combine these two streams, the face-to-face -face conversation with the virtual audience. And uh, I'm gonna begin this actually um, by bringing up one of the organizers. Uh, this is our dear friend, and just for me, a hero of mine, Joe Lambert, uh, one of the creators of Digital Storytelling, and he's one of the organizers of this great event. So let's bring him up on stage, if he's got time. Hello, Joe. Yeah, I, I got time. We're sitting in one of the rooms. Oh, great. Where a group is working on the issues of historical revisionism in the AR, XR, VR world that we can expect because of the way you know who who owns truth so we have eight groups today and they're gathered in different ways this is part of a conference and if you do me the favor of calling up samantha <laughs> who's sitting next to me let her tell you a little bit more about the larger project i can definitely do that if i can have samantha becker Hi, along with you can hear me? life is great we can hear you just fine sam can you hear us sorry i'm on uh there we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear us? Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, no, great to see you. Great to see both of you. Thank you for making time um, because I know you're running around like crazy to keep everything going. Um, so we've got we've got eight sessions. Uh, Joe was just describing one of the topics having to do with how augmented reality can lead to historical revisionism. And then he wanted me to bring you up, Sam, so you could tell us all more about the event. Yes. So it's really a future focused events uh, event. We started the day, of course, when we talk about the future, it has to incorporate student and learner voice. So mm. we started the day with a panel of learners from ages, I think, 19 to 80. Um, oh, yeah. Lifelong learning people currently engaged in taking courses. And we heard about their biggest challenges right now um, in education. A lot of it had to do with access with equity, with unequal distribution of resources and opportunity, also having to do with needing continual support beyond just academic. Then we heard from a panel of subject matter experts, which we were so delighted to have you on, Brian. Um, and we really considered um, larger societal shifts, especially related to technology around generative AI, around spatial technologies and health tech. Yeah, and so yeah. All of these discussions are now informing eight working groups who are focused on addressing 
eight future focus scenarios, some way more realistic sounding than others, but I think all potentially very likely. So Joe mentioned climate impact and the role of the treatment. Nug Group is uh, right now working on announcing hopefully responsive AI curriculum. Another group, yeah, teaching in a post truth era. So, mm -hmm. it's so well being in the digital age. So, lots of subjects that um, are around and, and involve technology, but are very human centric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can see that. How did you all come up with these uh, with these eight groups? Yeah, you know, I'm going to actually pass that back over to Joe since we're such a partnership here. <laughs> yeah, you, you mute it yourself. Otherwise I'm going to mute myself right now. In case you're curious, folks, you just need to hit the mute button on you. There you did. There she is. You're right next to each other. This is great. Ruben. Oh, this hey, Ruben. Hello. Here's me. Hello. So, yeah, the way this started. Was that we had a retreat at Ghost Ranch back in June. It was uh, gathered by Lev Donick, and we had people from all over the the country come in. And and we came up with some design principles. We came up with approaches. Our original intent was to gamify the conference in some way. And the, the way we decided the game would be is a series of what I call postcards from the future. So it's based on we started with six emergent trends and got some context. We came up with these eight stories. And the idea for me was, you know, somebody in the year 2074 saying, oh, well, <laughs> we, we wish, wish back in the 20s you had done this thing to make, you know, higher education more robust and to deal with things that, that we're seeing happening in the now. Like all science fiction is really about the now. But we're, we're using those stories to just initiate a discussion that will lead them to solution. And the, the hope is that each of the groups, either A or some subdivision of it, will come back tomorrow with, with a kind of quick and dirty shark tank like presentation of a solution in the you know in the area of resource, in the area of, of technology, in the area of the way social capital will be built. And 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 the theory is you know those solutions will be part of the outcome document that this crew of us, and again, Sam and our friends, Stephanie Karate from uh, Shaping EDU, uh, Peggy Snyder, who we knew for years at Autodesk and Adobe and Lev himself, that group formed by our design committee of 25 will, will come out with this document, hopefully in a month or so, that will be, you know, if not a manifesto, because there are a lot of those, a sort of reconstitution of the group that many of us were part of uh, the new media consortium, the intent to help lead uh, the way technology is used in education going forward. So yeah, mostly the work that you do every week, Brian. So it's like we just got a lot of people in the same room in reality, and you gather them each week virtually. So it's the same spirit. Well, thank you. That That's a great story, of course. Um, and I, I love I love all the creativity involved here. And I love that the two of you working with Lev and Stephanie have brought together so many cool people in one spot uh, to bring this up. Um, and there's already been uh, with you, um, there's been a, a panel this morning on uh, students. There's been a panel on, uh, on future topics that uh, we can put the jar got to lead. And I'm curious if, if what, are the, what are the major current themes that you're hearing from the session so far? What are people talking about? What's what's up in those in people's minds? Oh, it's, 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 it's. You go. Oh, Oops, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> no problem. I, I think it's what's interesting is that it's not necessarily like it's the same. It's different challenges every year. It's Honestly, like there are a lot of the same conversations around access, around accessibility, around making sure that learners and students are at the center of design. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, of course, you know, things like generative AI and extended reality in the mix, those have been brewing for, you know, years, although generative AI has really exploded. But I think what is, what actually never really surprises me is how actually the root issues and challenges don't seem to change. 
Mm. It's just that fresh perspectives and how to address them. Um, something that uh, um, I think it was Angela Gunder on the subject matter expert panel was talking about how academia may have previously kind of viewed itself as like a ship that takes forever to turn. Or I think one of the metaphor was like a turtle with a backpack. Um, but I think that um, what we're realizing is we were really forced in the last four years to make some pretty big changes to expand access and opportunity during the pandemic. And I think that taught us that we can be a lot more agile and nimble, and it doesn't have to be in the response of a disaster. We don't have to wait for mm. that to be mm. proactive. And so I'm really hoping that that will come out of this. Well, excellent, excellent. That kind of nimbleness is great. What are what, what are some of some of the other uh, perennial causes? Uh, I think I, I I think I heard one talking about the uh, uh, difficulty in transforming an entire institution when people said they could only work on one particular part of it at one time, like in a lab or in a uh, learning center. Um, were there other other perennials that we should have in mind here? I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer that. I think that um, a lot of, I think our organizational structures are being called into question and it really is not just the responsibility anymore of dedicated academic centers and teaching and learning centers anymore um, to build institutional capacity. I think it's about empowering everyone by building a culture of collaboration where you don't have to have innovation in your title. Um, how are we bringing communities together? How are we um, connecting students and faculty with education leaders and including everyone um, in those conversations um, is gonna continue to be vital. And I saw Amanda, one of our amazing uh, grad students just come sit down too. We sat in on our, and participated in our student panel and has some insights to share too. Well, th thank you, Sam. And uh, hello, Amanda. I'd love to hear from you. Tell us first, uh, what do you do as a grad student? What are you studying? Okay, one second. It's okay. Sorry. I think it's okay. Sam needs to mute and then uh, I need to unmute. I think it's people. Yeah, sorry. My, my audio was off. Um, on right. Whatever this computer is. Um, Welcome. So whatever, whatever you said just now. Oh, yeah, well, what I was asking was if um, if you could introduce yourself by saying, what do you study as a grad student? What are you working on? Yeah, so my my uh, grad program is secondary education, and I'm actually studying that to teach theater. Um, I was doing it for math, and then I switched it because I, <laughs> I was not ready for the challenge of the math classroom. Um, and I recognize that. Um, but yeah, so that's what I'm studying right now. Oh, excellent. Excellent. We're going to need a lot more of you out there doing this kind of great work. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. So, I mean, what did you what did you get to talk about on the panel this morning? And and what did you see What were or hear? What were some of the big ideas about the student perspective of education technology going forward? Yeah, so it seems like what I noticed that across the panelists, the student panelists, is that we're all looking at student centered education. And I feel like for the most part, the education sphere, higher ed and secondary ed, et cetera, we say that we always want it to be student centered and this and this and that. But in practice, a lot of the time, especially in secondary ed, you know, you have to do these core subjects and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a space like this, we were talking, I really like that we had the opportunity to think of like, if we had our perfect world in 50 years, like our perfect vision of education. And for the most part, a lot of us wa wanted kind of like a complete revamp, right? We wanted everything wow. like really student centered, like students choose their own, like choose what they learn rather than, you mm -hmm. know, like, oh, I got to learn uh, physics. I got to learn like mechanics and like all this stuff it's like i don't i don't want to learn that i want to do creative writing i want to do um you know i want i want to do theater um and so i feel like a lot of us were like let's have the students pick what skills they actually want to learn and what skills they're actually going to use and have them learn that in school um 
rather than you know forcing them to learn a bunch of things that they're not going to use um although some, some students think they're not going to use some things but then they do so there's also that as well <laughs> yeah yeah that's a perennial issue uh, trying to figure that out um i'm sorry it's amanda right yes um excellent excellent uh well this is I, i'm i'm curious uh thinking about technology how can we reshape technology to support that kind of student-centered uh, goal? I mean, for example, you know, should we push more content to mobile devices? Is there particular interfaces? I mean, is this where we should think about uh, maybe supporting the creation of more media? I mean, how do you connect technology with that goal? I think some of the like ideas that were thrown out there during um, the student panel was, you know, leveraging AI to uh, like personalize learning journeys for students. Um, and we also mentioned that, you know, we can't, we can't have technology or AI do everything. There needs to be that human touch and empathy involved mm -hmm. in that. Um, and so I definitely think that, you know, AI, AI could be leveraged for that, but also just engaging students with technology, like modern up-to-date technologies that are being used in industries. Because I feel like that's what a lot of programs were missing. Even for me in undergrad, I did my undergrad in animation. And wow. um, we, we used some programs like we used like Maya, which is sort of used in the industry, but nowadays a lot of people are using Blender and we oh. did not, Blender was not part of like the, the required course lists. I don't even think we had a Blender course until after I graduated, go figure. Um, <laughs> but I wish that I had learned Blender because that's what everyone's using. And so that's just an example, but have like giving students that opportunity to learn industry technologies and things that are actually yeah. being used. Yeah. Uh, Fred, if you're, if you're new to those two applications, they're both uh, 3D uh, animation programs. Uh, Maya is very, very powerful, uh, proprietary program, and Blender is an open source program. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's an excellent point. Thank you. Thank you for answering. That's, that's a terrific one. I have one last question for you. Uh, which of these working groups are you in right now? Are you in the, uh, the AI group, the augmented reality group? Which one? I'm in, I think it's scenario four. It's teaching in the post-truth era. Uh, um, uh, and I decided to pick that scenario because I'm going into education. And, you know, since starting my grad program and going into these classrooms and, you know, reading about different policies and like, what are all these there's restrictions that te what teachers can and can't teach, um, especially in Arizona. Um, yeah. And so I was really interested in kind of seeing like how we can combat like misinformation spread online or people that are unwilling to learn <laughs> about, you know, objective facts. Um, and one thing that we were talking about um, over there earlier was um, critical race theory, which is a, uh, a, I guess, a subset of just creative thinking in general or not creative, critical thinking in general. Mm -hmm. And critical thinking is obviously and I, I would hopefully say objectively a useful skill that people need to use in their lives um being able to discern information what you know what is you know not said in good faith and things like that and using critical thinking um to navigate history and life and society but unfortunately um there are some people in administration and in uh, the government that uh, have the wrong idea uh, about critical race theory. Um, and one thing that I've noticed is on like the US, not US, the Arizona like Department of Education website, there was a whole page saying that critical race theory is um, about teaching white people to be ashamed of their themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why, why is this on the government website? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is, it's just not true. If you read any scholarly article about critical race theory, it does not say that at all. And so that's one big thing that I was looking to sort of address and combat in that scenario group. Well, thank you. I mean, first of all, thank you for that for that detailed description. I think you'd be a fantastic person to work with in a group like this. Um, let, let me let me just 
stop interrogating you myself though let me ask the the group everybody here if you're new to the forum this is a place for your questions and your comments so again if, if you have a question for our excellent grad student amanda before we have to release her to go back to work um either click the raised hand button if you want to join us on stage or hit the q a box uh in fact uh we have a raised hand let me bring uh, mick garn uh, up on stage hang on one second let me add him to the screen it looks like we have your audio, but no video, Mike. Oh, let's, let's, uh, where did my little button go for that? Oh, it says activate camera. All right. Let, let me see if I can do that. Yeah. Uh, so Amanda, this is perfect timing. Uh, I was actually just reading an article this morning and it was talking about how AI would affect different disciplines differently. And one of the ones they said would have very little effect on was theater. I'm curious, I, since you know a lot about technology, you're getting into this, do you, what's the uh, thinking in the uh, theater community about generative AI and those kind of things? Um, I mean, when a lot of people think theater, they think like Broadway show, we're going to go sing and dance on stage. Um, and we're watching people in costumes and things like that, which, you know, at, at that at that level ai doesn't really have too much of an influence but when you think about the creative process behind that um the writing the costume designing the um you know even even the music right if it's going to be a musical um generative ai could be leveraged for those things and and when it comes to like creativity and the arts and things like that and using generative ai a lot of people you know are a little turned off by that for uh, obvious reasons you know like a, a lot of people think like oh i'm just gonna have generative ai make this picture for me i don't have to hire an artist to do it um or people are like oh like i don't want to draw that i'll have ai do it but what a lot of people don't realize is people enjoy doing that stuff people enjoy drawing people enjoy making costumes um so for i think a lot of people that are involved in the theater are just people that love doing that work so they don't really think about using generative AI to do that because they want to do it themselves. Um, but what's also interesting is people, when people, like I said, people think theater, they think probably musical, but there's actually a really large group of people that are doing experiential theater, immersive theater, um, integrating technologies into a theatrical performance. Um, mm -hmm. There's there's one that's pretty popular right now. That I can't remember the name of, but it's like an actual like immersive like building that you go in, and there's actors running around the space. And like you can follow an actor and like see what they're doing, and you're like taking mm -hmm. a peek into that actor's life, or not the actor's life, but the actor's character. Um, and so there's lots of interesting experiential theater uh, that is being made that I guarantee people are using generative AI to, um, you know, come up with some you know unique designs or uh, like or just like the artistic side of things and design part of things. So I mean, I think AI could be used in in theater but for the most part people that are in theater don't really they typically don't really think about it because they just want to do the work you know right right sounds like faculty to me <laughs> mike thank thank you for the great question thank you Thanks, for the great Ryan. question uh if you're if you're new to the forum there's an example of a video question um and uh we, we did have a, a quick note um uh amanda in in the chat um uh Andrea Bjorkorna, Bjorkorna, sorry, Andrea, I'm trying to get your name right, so that the uh, production of Sleep No More uh, did an yes. example that you're talking about, uh, which is great, which is great. Um, uh, Amanda, can we keep you on stage for another minute more? Yeah. Because I want to introduce uh, another person here who has just taken Samantha's place. I believe this is Director Davis. Hello. Hi. Hello. Oh, okay. um, Amanda, can you mute yourself here? There we go. Let's try to get Is it Georgia? Georgia Davis? Yeah, hi. Oh, <laughs> it's getting my audio fixed here. That's okay. Uh, so good to meet you. Yes, you too. You're from the other university in Arizona. <laughs> right. Well, there are three of them, but yeah, one of the other universities, an hour and a half south of Phoenix in wow. Tucson, Arizona, right? The University of Arizona. Well, excellent. Excellent. And 
we, we have a we have a tradition um, in in the forum when we ask people to introduce themselves we we ask it in a forward-looking way so uh, so we asked Amanda what she was studying and I, I'm, I'm curious what are you working on for the rest of the year what's uh, what are the big topics ahead for you um, and and your your role as your director of creative initiatives at University of Arizona right right in multimedia so I come out of um, broadcast television and radio and news and I did that for more than a decade and then I got a PhD in health geography and now I'm back in our teaching and learning center running our multimedia teams and our Adobe creative team and of course the definition of multimedia is changing on a regular basis so the newest initiative that I'm involved in is studying augmented reality and we just received a, a large grant to study what is actually happening on our campus right now um, we've got a lot of people who are moving into the world of using augmented reality um, how, or immersive reality. I guess I should say that because we want to encompass VR and AR. Um, but they're starting to move into it, but people are working still in these kind of silos trying to figure out how to use this within their particular discipline. And so we're going around, we're trying to study what everyone is doing and then start matching people up. Like we've discovered there are people that have lab space but don't have equipment. There are people that have equipment that don't have lab space. There are people that are doing research to understand how XR can actually impact student learning and retention. So we're trying to get all these people together in one space and then start thinking about what a roadmap for the future could like, which could look like for the University of Arizona. And hopefully turn this into some bigger um, campus-wide initiative and really start thinking about the way um, immersive reality could be used in disciplines, not just in STEM. We heard a lot about STEM earlier today at our conference, but in digital humanities, we have a, a lot of people doing work in, in that field right now or um, arts, right, across the, the disciplines. Oh, it's so glad to see augmented reality really coming into it. And I'm so glad that you're leading this um, at, at this university. Um, this is, uh, uh, I have so many questions. Before I ask questions, let me just make sure that the group knows. Please, everybody, if you have questions for either of our guests right now, um, please put the questions forward. Either click the raised hand button like Mick Darn did to join us on stage or hit the Q&A box um, and you can type in a Q and I'll, I'll raise that up. Uh, while people are thinking about this, um, Dr. Davis, let me, let me just ask, which of the groups are you part of that I've taken you out of? Uh, <laughs> I'm one of the facilitators for the mental well-being in the digital age. And so what we are exploring as you know, 50 years down the road, this notion that um, with digital, well, like this kind of hybrid being that we spoke about earlier, where people aren't quite human and aren't quite technology, but they're this kind of hybrid theme. So technology is pervasive and maybe even part of us, physically part of us. Um, how we can use these technologies in ways that help us while acknowledging the harm of digital addiction. Granted, I, I think that we may end up going in a number of different directions that aren't related specifically just to digital addiction. Um, mm. So we're trying to look for maybe policy or financial or social or institutional kinds of solutions that we can start to implement now um, that might set the stage for 50 years from now <laughs> being mm. prepared for, yeah, this kind of total immersion in technology. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Um, that's a, a, that's a tall order. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and, and, and you said, you, you said you got your PhD in health geography, right? Right. That's correct. Is, um, how does, how does that inform your thinking in this group? Well, it's interesting that you were just speaking about critical theory because I come very much out of a critical theoretical perspective. And so my research was very much involved in how in defining the object that we are studying or the process that we are using or even the disease entity that we are um, investigating, how not only does that allow us to know certain things, it also creates gaps in what we can actually know. And it, those gaps, I think, are fascinating places to study. And so it's not just the things we can't know, it's also the way we can't even conceptualize things because the way those gaps exist. Um, so in tangential to that work, I also think a lot about health social movements. And so there's more and more space for individuals to contribute to knowledge and science. For example, we get crowdsourcing of like rainfall data, and then that's 
aggregated and used to, well, in various ways. Um, but when it comes to health, we often um, we tell people that they're responsible for their own health. We even heard earlier today that we're moving toward individuals taking care of kind of the basics of their health and going mm -hmm. to their doctors for other kinds of things. Um, but at the same time, we often block people's ability to participate as like we deny people's experiences of health in, in many ways. And so we get health social movements out of this. And so like, through the pandemic, it was really interesting to watch because on the one hand, um, you know, there was a lot of misinformation out there. But on the other hand, we have to remember that when we make individuals responsible for their own health, they're going to become responsible for their own health. Yeah. Right. And I don't think we had enough of appreciation of that facet of what was going on through the pandemic. I also think that um, people develop these ideas because they feel powerless. And in some ways, like conspiracy theories, for example, can be a way that people bring or give, find power for themselves within the system. So sometimes it's not the, the theory that's so important, but it's some of the motivations behind the theory and then the power arrangements that are being like questions or reformed in some of the theories that arise. Yeah. Mm. Now, this is so true. I mean, especially a global pandemic is so vast and so scary. Um, uh, this is this is excellent. Um, friends, I, I'd love to hear your questions, uh, both for uh, uh, Amanda and for Georgia. Um, and in fact, before I even finish saying that sentence, uh, there's one that's come up. Uh, this is for you, Amanda. Uh, this is from our good friend, John Hollenbeck, who is uh, up in uh, up in Madison, Wisconsin. Let me put this on the screen. Uh, he asks, what one change would you make to the practice of school if you were queen of the universe? Wow. Okay. Is there still an echo? Okay, we're good. Um, all right. What well, one change would I make? Uh, one thing I talked about at the student panel was um, how I, if it were, if it was my perfect world, I would want every student to have their own life coach. So not just a career coach, but a life coach that is like a student's mentor, you know, and a good role model for that student that will be able to guide them along a personalized learning journey to help them architect their own education. And so, um, and that means, you know, not the typical things you learn in like K through 12 or, you know, even college. I feel like college might come close if you have like an interdisciplinary major, which luckily I was fortunate enough to have a major that was pretty interdisciplinary. Um, but high schoolers typically don't have that opportunity um, and depth and certainly not, you know, younger than that either. So I think that is something that I would like to implement into schooling um, for students to get that opportunity to learn more than, you know, you know, math, science, like just scratching the surface, like get them into like marine biology or, you know, ph pharmaceuticals, um, like more like CTE type courses, but like a plethora of them. So that's my ideal educational world. Just, just quickly, uh, define CTE. Uh, just if you could just define CTE. Yeah, CTE is career technical education. So it's uh, kind of like a, a program that's implemented in a lot of schools across the country. Um, at least, at least in Arizona, I'm pretty sure it's in schools all across the country. But um, it's things like uh, computer science. It's like a CTE course. Um, that I actually did take in high school. They also have uh, nursing. Um, they even have some some schools have like programs where um, the students go to school half the day and then the other half they go to like a sort of trade school. So that's yeah. the even yeah. program. Um, so they do exist, but um, I mean, they're not at the scale or like it's not as normalized as I would personally like it like them to be. Um, yeah. Understood. Understood. Would you would you accept a uh, AI in that role, or would you or would you rather have a person? I think. Sorry, it's getting a little loud in here. It's lunchtime. Okay. That's um, a good sign. But I think I do think AI could be leveraged in that space. And, and like I said, I feel like there still needs to be that human touch so that students have a role model that isn't, you know, not a human. Um, but. I definitely think AI could be leveraged to 
help help make that curriculum for the student like yeah. and the the mentor or the life coach could use that ai as a resource as a tool um to assist them with that and i think a lot of people I, I said this in the student panel but i think a lot of people see ai as something that can do something for them and it can like replace something or it's like i don't want to do this thing entirely i'm going to have ai do it for me uh -huh. but uh -huh. i would i would personally like to challenge people and personally use ai as as a tool or a resource rather than something that will just do everything for me like how can we leverage ai as as a tool for us um Mm. To, to do things ourselves. Mm. Well, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that's a great answer. And uh, John, thank you for the question. If you're new to the forum, that's an example of a, a Q&A box question right there. Uh, by the way, in the chat, our dear friend Roxanne Riskin says, life mentors are often senior citizens, uh, which is a great way of thinking of intergenerational um, uh, learning. Um, well, uh, this is terrific. Amanda, thank you so much. Uh, if, if you have to run, I, I don't want to keep you any longer, um, but good luck. Um, I really look forward to seeing what you get to do in this world. Thank you, and thank you guys for having me. Uh, a pleasure, a pleasure. Um, Georgia, um, I, have, I have one question while I'm waiting for everybody else's uh, questions to come in. Um, we were talking about some changes to the human, what it means to be human. We were talking about uh, Neuralink. We were talking about uh, changes in biology, in lifespan, uh, and ways the technology can really impact um, the, what it means to be human. I'm curious, how do you think that might change addiction? So, for example, should we, should we expect a, uh, a neural implant which could help short circuit some of the neurology of addiction? Oh, uh, wow. Um, yeah, I know that's a complicated question um, because we're trying to weigh this notion of human agency and preference against what we can do with the technology at the same time that we're weighing the notion that technology can benefit us, it can extend our capacities mm -hmm. at the same time that we're concerned with addiction. So I think it's, it's a really thorny question because we start thinking about things like, let's put time limits on how long somebody can be engaged with technology in some way. Mm -hmm. Are we starting to impede in people's autonomy? So I'm not really sure, honestly, how to answer that question because I think we've got a way multiple factors um, and then maybe perhaps some of it is giving people control over the technology and their ability to I don't know put their old time limits in it, it's so hard for me to conceptualize what 50 years from now is going to look like in all honesty too um, but I think that's it I think that's what we have to grapple with we have to grapple with personal agency we have to grapple with um, what is the role of technology in, in governing things like digital addiction. And then we also have to grapple with privacy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right? I think that's a really important factor in all of this too. And I know maybe that doesn't really fit with this topic of mental well-being. Well, but I think it does. I mean, yeah. I think it does. Because when we're talking about these connections between the human and the machine, like these intimate connections, mm -hmm. we're talking mm -hmm. about, right, complete invasion of privacy in some ways. And how do we yeah. ensure privacy yeah. if we're yeah. implanting in people's heads? And because we're not talking about this thing that lives independently within the space of the body. We're talking about this thing that lives in the body and is connected to the world around it in kind of profound ways that I think we, we have a difficult time even understanding. Um, so I don't know that I really got at your answer. I think I, or your or, question, I think I tried to beat it more than anything. <laughs> really you did sure. great. That's, that's a great answer. I really, really appreciate you, you taking the time to, to explore that. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, I'd love to follow up and learn more about your work. Um, I, I'd love you know, to connect you to uh, my students in some ways. Um, but uh, let me let you go back to your group, uh, Georgia, and uh, let's um, um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, yeah, we, you're very welcome. Uh, let's, uh, let's see if we can bring um, our, our favorite guest, uh, favorite friend, Tom Hames, in uh, on that setting. 
And uh, while we're doing this, uh, uh, Ruben, um, actually, can you? Uh, all right. So, yes. hi, Brian. We're both here. Uh, just... Uh, we're going to migrate the laptops to a different location because our noise level here is kind of high. So we'll understood. Back with you in just a second. Okay, no problem, no problem. Uh, we, hello, and, and a great a great side effect of this is that if we don't have audio for a second, we do have the visual, so you can see the different people moving around. We can see the crowds. I think it's lunchtime there. People are feeding, which is great. Um, and I also enjoy just hearing the positive buzz uh, of all of this. Um, we have a, a great question coming up in the pipeline uh, from Victor uh, Viegas. So we're going to bring that up as soon as our our, uh, our two local guests get a chance to uh, settle down. Um, in the in the chat, Brent Presley says, "My science fiction love kicking in here. Could something like Neuralink help with addiction, but then cause addiction to itself?" Definitely classic themes, Brent. Uh, absolutely. Uh, that's you know you wonder about taking care of one thing, but then leading to the other. Uh, also in the chat, uh, Roxanne says, AIA, AI anxiety is infused in digital addiction, but it might not be included in the DSMV. Yeah, I, I really am I'm curious to see where that ends up. Um, thank you. Uh, and Mark Corbett Wilson adds a great political observation, which have problematized the power of the owners of these technologies, so not just the technology itself. Uh, so thank you. Um, uh, Sam, you look a lot like um, uh, Tom Hames. <laughs> Good to see you, sir. Good to see you. How you doing? Very Very quiet. Well. I can actually hear you, and you could theoretically hear me as well. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Ruben's machine is is uh, having connection issues. Well, so while while he works on that, uh, and Wesson, you might want to just pounce on that and see if that can. Uh, uh, if if we can solve I think that. Wi-Fi. I got a little. It got a little. Oh, there he is. He sees back now. You're back. I, I think good. there's certain aspects of this lobby that are not well covered on Wi-Fi. But oh, that may be. Uh, before before I get to ask a question, um, a former student of mine, Anel Albertau, asks, "What is the name of the current speaker?" So the gentleman with the excellent hair and facial hair is Ruben Puente Dura. Uh, from Massachusetts, who is a wonderful uh, computer scientist, creator, designer, consultant, in many ways best known for creating the SAMR method. Um, over on the on the right is our friend uh, Tom Hames, coming to us from the who is from the Houston area, who is also an instructional designer, uh, an educational space designer, and just a great thinker about educational technology. Um, he does have this problem of not having a beard, but we allow him in anyway um, as a result. Um, friends, but, but before you get to talk, we, we have a question that came in, um, and I wanted to share it with you because I think you both would have a fun time uh, tackling this. This is from uh, Victor Villegas, uh, who is coming to us from uh, Oregon State University. Uh, and he asks, what are some of the examples or discussions around culturally responsive AI? Well, we just literally had a conversation about that in the uh, post-truth group. And I think Ruben's, you might want to mute I think you're echoing me. <laughs> um, we just yeah. literally had a conversation about that in the post truth group. Uh, and uh, one of the participants thought that uh, we were going to be colonized by AI in the way that, uh, that uh, countries have colonized other indigenous peoples around the world. Uh, and basically, uh, rebooted their cultures uh, mm -hmm. and um, through that contact. I'm not sure I share that belief uh, because in some ways AI is us. I mean, yes, it's going to do that, but it's going to do that in a way that I don't think is, I, I wouldn't say it, would, it could be oppressive if we handle it wrong, but I, you know, that the other point I made there was, um, are we going to be AI's partner or its servant? Uh, and I'm hopeful that we're going to be a partner. Uh, and I think openness is a big part of that. I think we need to get past that that mindset of black boxes because that is a, not understanding what's happening is a good way to become a servant. Uh, and you just follow directions of whoever, or you follow the, the prompts of whoever's spitting you information. You go, okay, that's true. I'm going to go for that. Um, but if we use it as a partner, as a way of assim assimilating lots of different ideas, and perspectives, we can bring some of those, hopefully bring some of those lost perspectives back into the into the picture. 
uh, something I said a few weeks ago in the forum with another guest. Excellent. Um, Excellent. People are people are skeptical of that, and rightfully so. It's something. It's a, there is a threat there, but the threat is us and the people who we allow to control the technology. Oh. I, I'm a big fan of it for, re, for that reason. Uh, we're too. only going to get to truth through openness. You never get to truth through closed. Do you think that uh, um, if if we rely and if we use more and more open uh, open source uh, AI and more open data for training AI, do you think this will allow us to uh, have more and more cultures represented? Yes. I mean, there's no. I mean, I don't see how you do it otherwise. To be honest, to get that level of diversity of thought, of meaning, um, and of an understanding of the processes that the AI is is going through to assimilate or to not assimilate to a pro, uh, process that pro, that's that information you know, uh, and, and synthesize, synthesize is the word I'm looking for. Synthesize that information. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, what, why don't you mute so we can allow? Um, this George Lambert cosplayer. I don't know who this is. Uh, why don't we allow Ruben to take over? Yeah. So Ruben, we need your audio on. Yep. So, yeah. Uh, Here, I'll put, I'll put this on the screen. Mute your audio. OK. So. Okay. T turn on your speaker. Sorry, we're we're negotiating across a lobby here. Echoes and some weird effects. All right. So you know it's interesting because one thing that I think is a common feature in most of the conversations I've heard so far about AI in this group is an assumption of abundance in terms of AI. Once upon a time, not that long ago, the assumption would have been this is a scarce resource that requires huge amounts of material, huge computing power, you know, only a few yeah. can access it. And I think the conversation, you know, ever since the launch of ChatGPT has completely shifted the dynamic. You know, you have that now it's present in Microsoft across the board. You've had Google with some missteps, but nonetheless, incorporating it. in other words people are taking it as a given the same way they take you know search online as a given the same way they take wikipedia as a given so it's very interesting because that shifts the dynamic you know it changes it from a conversation of scarcity to a conversation of plenty mm -hmm. that has both pros and cons yeah. the pro is that people aren't so concerned about how will i access this and are thinking what can i make of it the downside is it tends to take the form of, well, all AI looks a lot like ChatGPT. So mm -hmm. you're not hearing as much about other venues of AI, so you're not hearing as much about other forms of, whether it's different types of generative or machine learning, et cetera. And you're also not hearing as much about open source, Libre AI, which as you know, is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. But I'm also encouraged that I think you can get the conversation going. In other words, once people no longer see AI as something remote, alien, and distant, Mm -hmm. That only if you can for you can say, well, okay, what if you had your own or you could roll your own or you had other alternatives that weren't just the default? So that's one feature I've seen, you know, this this shift of the conversation from you know in you know years past to this conver of a conversation of scarcity to a conversation of plenitude. And the second aspect I would say also that to me is intriguing in terms of what you're seeing so, uh, starting around the conversations with AI is Tom's already gotten to it, you know, which is the fact that people are still thinking in terms of wholesale job replacement, whether that's bad, I will lose my job, or it's good We're in a post labor society. And I'm, even though there are some aspects of beginning to talk about task replacement or task modification or task redefinition, et cetera, around AI, that still isn't embedded as much in the conversation as the other two. So again, I'll be interested to see if from these groups conversations, you're going to see an evolution from the job replacement, whether good or bad, to more the task replacement, thinking about AI. So those are two aspects that I would say I've noticed in the conversations thus far. Oh, that's fascinating. That's fa so. First of all, Victor, thank you for the great question. Um, I mean, that's that's I think one of those provocative group topics that uh, that you have there um, at the summit. And thank you both, um, you know, Tom and uh, Ruben, for these really really good answers. Um, I, I think uh, you know, I mean, just personally, I think open is a great way for this. Uh, 
Now I'm 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 curious. Uh, okay, friends, we we only have five minutes left, so I'm going to take advantage of the moderator's position to be able to ask a question myself. But if you have any other questions that are left, please please feel free to either you know jump on the stage. In fact, here I'll uh, I'll enable an open podium so you can just do that, um, or um, you know click the uh, uh, the Q and A box. Um, I'm curious about um, how people were talking about uh, climate change. There's a climate change group uh, working away right now, and I, I spoke to this briefly on my on my brief appearance on the on the panel. Uh, how is this coming? Is it is it are are you seeing people talk about climate change in terms of climate justice, linking it to other topics? Uh, has anyone made connections between, for example, AI and the you know, enormous carbon footprint it can have? Uh, what what kind of discussions have you seen about that? We've we've got Ruben on on the mic right now. You can throw it off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I would say that it'll be very interesting to see uh, Brian because so far we haven't seen that much in terms of what was discussed in the different panels. It came up a little bit, other than of course your own uh, contribution, but it wasn't a major topic. Now that being said and done, I have had some corridor conversations with people, you know, by the. Uh, by the coffee maker while well, you know we're all trying to convince the machine to make the perfect cup of coffee etc but one of the key topics that keeps cropping up in that context is in the context of water water as you know is a huge topic here in arizona mm -hmm. and i'm hearing a lot of conversations around that so it's early of course in the series you know we've got today and tomorrow for the discussion but if i had to gauge from what i've heard thus far and I'll know more, of course, once I've spoken with the groups that are working specifically on the topic. I would hazard that we're going to see water and water resources and how water resources are managed, handled, etc., as a key topic around which a lot of the climate discussion will focus. But that's what I've seen so far. Well, that makes sense for uh, Arizona very, very much. Um, thank you. Thank you for that snapshot. Tom, would you like to... Um, uh, Add to uh, funny. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Now you're going to have to mute everything. We're sitting five feet away. This platform is not designed for people sitting across the room, for, across the t small table from each other. Yeah. It's, um, it's best to just you know trade the, the same machine in that case. Right. Um, I will say one thing that you know our scenario for the post truth group did feature a uh, educational. Technology. I mean, an educational designer, someone who's a facilitator, for um, struggling with um, post truth in a in a barely habitable Southern Arizona, you know, uh, college town. Um, and one of the thoughts that occurred to me around that, and the it came up in my group, and and I, well, I admit I brought it up, but was I had a very distinct Canticle for Leibowitz vibe coming off of that, and the idea that. You know this this isolation, the climate, uh, the, the climate, the environment drove the isolation of this environment to where they were having struggling with these discussions in part because they're so isolated, uh, and that their communities were very much tied down by the the uh, circumstances of what Southern Arizona is going to be like in 50 years if we don't make some serious changes, um, and that 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 in and of itself drove the conversation around knowledge and communication and discourse um, in, a, in a fundamental level. Um, and it affected this conversation about, again, what is, you know, how are we, are we, are we talking about our local conversation here? How are we connected to the broader conversations of the world? That sort of thing. And the same sort of thing that, that uh, uh, Miller was struggling through with, in Canticle Le for Leibowitz, and, and I thought that was, I don't know who made the video or if they seen or they read the book, but I just thought that was kind of an interesting, and maybe I'm just, I'm just crazy. That's entirely possible. Too. Uh, that seems very unlikely. Um, uh, that, by the way, if, if you haven't, if you haven't read it, Canticle for Leibowitz is one of the great American novels. Uh, I put a link to it in the chat there. Um, and if you haven't read it, you should just grab a copy. Um, gentlemen, we are, we are at the end of our hour. Um, let me just quickly ask, as a as a as a parting uh, gesture, uh, what are you looking forward to for the rest of the day? Uh, Tom, why don't you start us off? Well, I mean, we were just getting through the reactions to the video, uh, but we we're already starting to talk about um, 
you know, my personal bugaboo is we need to have as broad a information environment as possible. How do we use technology to create that and enhance that AI, visualization, mapping, that sort of thing. Um, but that's that idea of, you know, narrow views versus broad views was very much a theme in my group. And so uh, I'll be interested to see what kind of ideas come out of that in terms of how do we exactly um, create environments where people will trust views that are not part of their own narrow communities. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about that. How big a lens, how wide a lens versus how narrow a lens. And the post-truthers are very often very much operating with a very narrow lens because they deliberately exclude a lot of stuff. Hmm. Or let me rephrase it, the alternative truthers. I don't think they're post-truthers. I don't, I don't think we ever had a truth, but that's another story. Okay. So I'll hand it over to Ruben. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. So, yeah, for, for my part, you know, my role now for the rest of the sessions is going to be to go among the different groups and sort of cross-pollinate, question, et cetera. So what I'm most looking forward to, to be perfectly honest, is what I call the sense of surprise. When I join a group and something comes up, I say, oh, wow. I never thought of that. That's amazing. That's a great idea. Or, you yeah. know, that, that that's yeah. that's wild. You know, so so that's what I'm looking forward to. That that, you know, the unexpected, the surprise aspect. Yeah, that's the best. That's yeah, the best. That's the best. Well, thank you. Thank you both so much. Please go back go back to the sessions, give our best to the whole community there at the summit. And uh, we look forward to hearing what comes next. Um, and please give our best to uh, Joe and Sam for starting off this hour with us. Thank you so much. We will do that. Thank you so much, Brian. And uh, uh, friends, thank you for uh, joining with us in this uh, hybrid live session. Uh, I really appreciate your questions and comments. Uh, Mark Corbett Wilson actually suggests in the chat one of my other favorite novels, uh, Blood Meridian. Thank you, sir. Um, if you'd like to talk about this, um, there's already some discussion on the socials about the summit, uh, so you can head to them. Use the hashtag FTTE if you'd like to link back to our session, and you can see there are all kinds of links for, uh, for me on these different platforms. If you'd like to look into our previous sessions where we've discussed everything from environment to AI uh, to creativity to open source, just go to our, into our giant archive, tinyurl.com slash FTFarchive. Uh, if you'd like to look ahead, we have a whole series of sessions coming up on other topics, including one on abundance that uh, that Ruben was mentioning. We have our new paradigm project conversations with Department of Education, leading from the margins and still more. Um, thank you all for uh, joining us for this fun session. I really appreciate your, your comments and your thoughts. Um, I hope all of you are doing well if you are either at uh, Arizona State University or somewhere else in the world. Uh, please take care. Uh, we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.